Each year, proceeds from the annual Willa Luncheon benefit girls and women in Palm Beach County through scholarships as well as the Lois Quasman Program for Community Impact, which provides grant funding for critical programs that change the lives of children, teens, and young adults. Please join us for our virtual Will event on Friday, April 30th from noon to 1 p.m. Visit our website at www.ewpb.org for more information. So now let me introduce you to our esteemed speaker today, Harvey Oyer. Harvey is a partner in the West Palm Beach office of Schutz and Bowen, where he is a member of the real estate practice group. As a fifth generation native of Palm Beach County, Harvey brings a unique perspective to his understanding of the issues face, facing the region, its real estate market and development. He is one of the region's leading land use and zoning lawyers, having led the approval of many of the county's largest and most iconic projects. Harvey has earned numerous professional and community awards, including being named one of the 100 most influential, influential Floridians by Florida International Magazine, that's a tongue twister, and receiving the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Harvey has been recognized as one of the 21st, I'm sorry, 25th most powerful people in Palm Beach County by Boca Life Magazine. He currently serves as chairman of the Foreign Club of the Palm Beaches, chair elect of the Business Development Board of Palm Beach County, a director of Good Samaritan Medical Center, a director of the Promise Fund, and a trustee and general counsel of the South Florida Science Center and Aquarium. He is past chairman of the Chamber of Commerce of the Palm Beaches and the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. Harvey is an accomplished historian, lecturer, and writer on law, history, and archaeology topics, as well as international laws on antiquities trafficking and cultural property protection. He served as an adjunct professor at the University of Miami School of Law and the Florida Atlantic University Honors College. He is the author of five award-winning and best-selling children's books that are widely used in Florida schools. In 2013, he was named Florida's Distinguished Author. Harvey is a former Marine Corps captain and part-time adventurer who cross-country skied to the North Pole in April 2018. Wow. We are honored to have Harvey join us this afternoon for a historical perspective on women in South Florida. Please join me in welcoming Harvey Oyer. Thank you and good afternoon and, and thank you for inviting me. I spoke to your group years ago and appreciate the uh, return invitation. So as you know, uh, two days ago was International Women's Day and we are in the midst of um, Women's History Month, uh, the month of March. So I was asked to put together a brief presentation about uh, maybe some lesser known uh, ladies in our local history that uh, you probably have not heard of, or at least not heard of most of them, but they made very significant contributions to the county. And I thought it would be fun to go through uh, some of these and if we could pull up the PowerPoint and I'll go through them rather fast. So um, if you have other things to do with your day, we're not on the Zoom call, uh, but I think it will pique some uh, questions at the end, which I'm delighted to stay around as long as you want me to. So why don't we do this in uh, chronological order? Uh, first slide, please, or next slide. And what I didn't have the benefit of was uh, any Native American women in our area that were influential. So I don't want anyone on this call to mistakenly think that there were not um, several thousand years of significant contributions by pre-Columbian Native Americans, even post-Columbian uh, Native Americans. Uh, we simply don't have a record, so I'm not knowledgeable enough to share it with you. So I'm going to start with a very easy one for me. Uh, Lily Pierce Voss, she was the first white child born between Jupiter and uh, Miami, meaning she was the first non-Native American born in a geographic area that today has over 7 million people. Uh, so uh, she was the first pioneer uh, associated with this area, and coincidentally, she was also my great-grandmother. So this is an easy one to speak to. Next slide, please. 
This is Lily, the earliest known photo we have of her. She was born in 1876. Uh, this is her at four years old. The only photo of her holding a doll, because if any of you know that who Lily turned out to be, she turned out to be sort of the ultimate tomboy. She grew up in a wild jungle frontier with only boys to play with. She was um, uh, hyper competitive with the boys. She could run faster, jump higher, spit further, climb a tree faster, won every shooting competition. And even into her old age, she lived to be 91 years old. She was still sort of a tough, cantankerous tomboy, not a sweet old lady. Um, and she had a pretty profound impact on the development of the community that we know today. Um, next slide, please. Her family came here in the 1870s, her parents, my great, great grandparents, their last name was Pierce. Fort Pierce is named after a member of the family, uh, but uh, our original family homestead in what is today Fort Pierce burned down. The family came further south. Her father uh, got a job as one of the keepers of the Jupiter Lighthouse, which is what brought him to what would eventually become Palm Beach County. But at that point, there we were still 40 years away from the creation of Palm Beach County. It was still part of Dade County. So family actually started in Jupiter. She was not yet alive when the family lived at the lighthouse. She was born a few years later. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the home that she grew up in on Hypoluxo Island. Uh, and that man with the long black beard leaning against the post on the right is her father, my great, great grandfather. And this house was constructed entirely of shipwreck timbers with a palmetto frond thatched roof uh, that the Seminole Indians uh, built for us. Uh, they were the only other people here when my family arrived. Next slide, please. Uh, this is where Lily was actually born. It was called the Orange Grove House of Refuge. It sat on Delray's, what is today the city of Delray Beach's public beach. If you take Atlantic Avenue East A1A, there is a Marriott Hotel on your left, and uh, across the street from that is a National Register of Historic Places marker where this stood. That's where she was born in August of 1876. Let me try to put this in perspective for you ladies. She lived until 1967. And many people on this Zoom call were alive in 1967. You could have known the first non-Native American ever born in Southeast Florida. And I tell you that because it really illustrates how recent and explosive our growth has been, that in your lifetime, you could have known the first non-Seminole Indian to live in an area that has between seven and eight million people today. Pretty extraordinary illustration of the growth. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, another image, and I have very few of her in her early days. Uh, that's her with the pigtail. Uh, that's her brother, Charlie, on the right. And in the intro, you heard that I write a children's book series. It's called The Adventures of Charlie Pierce. And uh, the protagonist is her brother, Charlie, on the right. But I very easily could have called it The Adventures of Lily Pierce. Her life was equally as interesting. Um, interesting, uh, Charlie was elected by the legislature as a great Floridian. So his bust is in the uh, rotunda of the Capitol in Tallahassee, but right next to him is the Florida Women's Hall of Fame, uh, which his sister Lily was elected to. So the only brother and sister, uh, both in the rotunda of Florida's Capitol. Now, what is it that Lily did that was significant other than just being, you know, the first child born here? Well, uh, our family uh, salvaged the uh, coconuts from the wreck of the Providencia which gave Palm Beach, West Palm Beach and Palm Beach County their names. She participated in that. She was a writer and historian. Her diaries and journals have been important to learning the history of South Florida. But when she grew up, she married my great grandfather who was a boat captain and together they took two men from Michigan to the south end of the lake. One's name was um, uh, William Linton and the other was Major Nathan Boynton and they sold him the land that would become Boynton Beach uh, and further down uh, the lake sold Linton and his friend David Swinton the land that would become Del Rey. Of course, Boynton Beach is named after Major Boynton. Del Rey 
was originally called the town of Linton, later changed its name to Delray Beach. And the only remnants of our friends Linton and Swinton are the two major roadways in Delray. But uh, without Lily's involvement, our uh, third and fourth largest municipalities in Palm Beach County would not exist. Uh, she had many other contributions to the community, but I want to keep moving. Uh, I only use her as an intro as our first one. So why don't we skip two slides ahead and let's talk about another early pioneer. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Millie Gildersleeve. Um, I have an image of her on the next slide. There we go. Uh, Millie Gildersleeve came here shortly after our family. Our family arrived in the 1870s. She arrived in the 1880s. She was actually uh, uh, from North Florida, African-American, came here with the Dimmick family. The Dimmicks were other early pioneers. Cap Dimmick became the first mayor of Palm Beach, platted the town of Palm Beach. If you go over the middle bridge to Palm Beach, there's a statue of him in the median. Um, she moved down with the Dimmicks to effectively be the nanny for all of the Dimmick children, and there were many. Uh, so that is what brought her here. But she later, um, and, and she was in her early 20s when she arrived with the Dimmicks, she later married a man named Jake uh, Gildersleeve, and uh, the Dimmicks sold them land on uh, the west side of the lake in what is today the city of Riviera Beach. So to my knowledge, this is the first African-American family that owned land in all of Southeast Florida. There were other African-Americans that uh, came through, rented land, but these were, to my best knowledge, the first property owners. She then, after finishing nannying for the Dimmicks, actually took up her real occupation. She had been trained in Jacksonville as a midwife, and she paired up with another early pioneer whose last name was Potter, and he was the only doctor in Dade County, which stretched from the St. Lucie River to the Florida Keys. And she became the midwife that traveled with him and delivered all of the pioneer children uh, in Southeast Florida for several decades. And it didn't matter if they were black or white or where they came from, she was the midwife who delivered them. Um, she actually over time became quite a land baron um, assembling a lot of the land in what is today Riviera Beach and West Palm Beach. So when she died in the 40s or 50s, she actually had quite a substantial estate to probate, um, which um, uh, I recently read some of the documents on. It's quite interesting that uh, the daughter of a slave who came here as a nanny wound up being one of the largest land barons in Palm Beach County in her era. Her family is still here. You probably know some of them. Her descendants include uh, current county court judge uh, Bradley Harper, who is a great great grandson, uh, and another Harper who was in the state legislature uh, a decade or so ago. Uh, so, uh, very important lady in our history. Next uh, slide, please. Now, I'm going to talk about a Another early lady in our history, uh, also African-American, if we can get to the next slide. Her name was Fanny James. And Fanny, unfortunately, we have no image of. Fanny was an early settler of what is today the city of Lake Worth Beach, which is still hard for me to say. I still say Lake Worth. Um, next slide, please. The best I could do is a painting that someone did of Fanny James's homestead on the shores of the body of water Lake Worth, but also in what is today the city of Lake Worth Beach. And this is one of my favorite all-time stories in Palm Beach County's history, that Fanny James, African-American, and her husband Samuel James, also African-American, moved here in the 1880s. And long before we had any semblance of local government, no city hall, no mayor, no sheriff. The only official that we had that served multiple purposes, wore multiple hats, was being the postmaster. And it was the most important job in Pioneer uh, Southeast Florida because the postmaster not only held the most valuable thing that you would get, which was your mail, which would arrive sporadically, um, not even once a week, 
but it was also the postmaster served as the fiduciary. That's where if someone had to hold a deposit for a land purchase, the postmaster held the money. Uh, the post office was the polling location for elections. So they were the de facto supervisor of elections. Um, it, it was really the center of all importance in the pioneer era. As a consequence, uh, the pioneers would always pick the person they trusted the most to be the postmaster. While the postmaster of what would eventually become Lake Worth, it was called Jewel, J-E-W-E-L-L -E -L -L, at the time, uh, was Fanny James. And I find this remarkable in the 1880s, um, a decade and a half after the end of the American Civil War in the Deep South, in a former Confederate state, Florida, and 40 years before women would even be allowed to vote in this country, all the white guys got together and said, who do we trust the most to hold our money, our mail, and our ballots? And they picked an African-American female, Fanny James. And this is, was, I thought, one of the great stories in the pioneer history of Florida. It was virtually lost to history. It was really only captured in a journal by my uncle Charlie. Uh, Fanny and Samuel died with no heirs, so their line died out. And this story, too, would have died out. But fortunately, it's alive. And a man in Lake Worth named Ted Brownstein wrote a fantastic book about it a few years ago. And about a decade and a half ago, the Historical Society of Palm Beach County named uh, one of their awards, the Fannie James Award. So now uh, you might have heard the name. Uh, and uh, I uh, am proud of Ted for writing the book and proud of the Historical Society for naming an annual award in her honor, really honoring one of the most interesting ladies uh, in our local history. Now, when the city of Lake Worth was later incorporated in Jewel in a way, she was still the most important person in Lake Worth. But Lake Worth, like all cities or most Florida cities of that era, uh, was segregated. And they literally drew a line down the middle of the city of Lake Worth, whites on one half, blacks on the other half. But there was a problem, ladies, and that is Fannie James's homestead, which was substantial, was on the wrong side of the line. So now she was living uh, where she was not allowed to live. So the, the white city fathers redrew the boundaries so that the line went around her house, gerrymandering it so that she could legally stay on her homestead, but be on the black side of, of town. And after she passed away, they straightened the line out uh, to their original intention, which was a straight line as the city remained segregated for several more decades. And I found that too to be remarkable that the white fathers of the town of Lake Worth had that much respect for her that they drew the city boundaries around her homestead. Next slide, please. I now wanna talk about uh, the first family of education in Palm Beach County's history and actually Dade County's history. And it started with a lady named Hattie Gale. Next slide, please. Back when we were part of Dade County, so Broward did not exist, Palm Beach County did not exist, Martin County did not exist. There uh, were no schools in all of Dade County. Ironically, uh, there was a school board, which I thought this was astonishing. We had an elected school board who oversaw absolutely zero schools. If that's not the height of bureaucracy, I don't know what is. But eventually we had a large enough population up at this end of Dade County that we needed a school. And so we petitioned this school board largely centered down in the Miami end of Dade County and demanded that we get a school. Well, they were not too keen to uh, spend money to build a school. So they told us that if we found land, donated it, built a school ourselves, they would at least hire the teacher. Uh, thinking that that would get us to go away. But of course, the resourceful people at this end of Dade County did get the land donated, did build a school, and that forced the hand of the school board to hire a teacher. Well, that is her in the doorway, 16-year-old Hattie Gale. And she became the first school teacher in Dade County's history. 
uh, taught students of all ages from kindergarten to 18, meaning she was teaching students even older than she was. Um, and her father, Dr. Elbridge Gale, was the first superintendent of schools. So clearly no anti-nepotism rule. The superintendent hired his own daughter to be the only school teacher in Dade County. He too was an interesting character. He was a bona fide uh, PhD university professor in horticulture. He's the one who brought mangoes to this area and everything that is today Mangonia Park, which is its own municipality, as well as everything in the north end of West Palm, um, Northwood Hills, Old Northwood, Northwood Shores, all of that was his homestead. And if you go into Northwood Hills, there are still some of his original mango trees. Uh, and he was quite scientific in his hybriding of uh, mangoes. So he was a, um, a plant scientist, a homesteader, the first school superintendent. And we even have a school in Palm Beach County named after him, Elbridge Gale Elementary. They were truly the first family of public education uh, in uh, what is today Palm Beach County, but all of Dade County. Next slide, please. Now, this is an incredibly interesting person, Bird Spillman Dewey. She went by Birdie. Next slide, please. This is Birdie Dewey. Uh, her and her husband, Fred Dewey, uh, moved to this area in 1887. They had lived in North Florida since 1881, and she accomplished many things, uh, most famous of which being a writer. She started uh, writing just local articles on uh, recipes and homemaking and advice columns in what is, was the predecessor newspaper to the Palm Beach Post. It was called the Tropical Sun, but she was quite a skilled writer and eventually wrote articles for Ladies Home Journal, Vogue, Good Housekeeping. Uh, her first book called Bruno was a bestseller. It sold over 100,000 copies in its first year of publication. Uh, in the 1800s at a time when, you know, 100,000 copies of a book sold in America was extraordinary. Um, she wrote many of her articles under pen names. Her first book was published by Little Brown and Company, one of the top publishers in American history, if that gives you an idea of the quality of her writing. Little Brown and Company at the same time was publishing Louisa May Alcott and Emily Dickinson, if that gives you an idea of the caliber of Bertie's uh, literary skill. Well, she uh, owned land on Lake Mangonia, about 70 acres that she farmed with her husband, Fred, but her revenues from writing uh, became significant and she started investing in land. And so they built a home on what is today South Flagler Drive in West Palm Beach, where Rapallo South uh, Condominium is located and they named their home Ben Trabato, which in Italian means uh, well found. And, uh, and that was their home. And Fred became a Dade County commissioner, the Dade County tax collector, the Dade County property appraiser. He also became one of uh, Henry Flagler's top executives in Flagler's company. And as the area grew and Rockefellers and Vanderbilts and Astors and Phipps has moved to the area, that's who they socialized with. And they began hosting um, America's industrial elite at their home, Ben Travato, on what is today South Flagler Drive. Next image, please. This is her and her husband, Fred, who was quite accomplished in his own right. Next slide, please. This is the home that they had on Lake Mangonia. Uh, when it was absolutely middle of the pine woods. They were the only people there. Next slide. This is her dog, Bruno, that her best-selling book was named after. She wrote a couple of other books that sold very well, also named after her pets. And uh, they were really biographical books about her and Fred's life in West Palm Beach in South Florida, but uh, they didn't use their real names. It, it took later historical researchers to put together the pieces that those books were really autobiographical. Next slide, please. This is the home Ben Travato that stood where Rapallo South was. And here they hosted Flagler, the Vanderbilt family, even President Woodrow Wilson and his wife. 
So pretty extraordinary stuff that, you know, President Wilson and his wife were dining on the front lawn of what is today South Flagler Drive. She even later contributed to Woodrow Wilson's uh, White House cookbook. They then went further south and bought land um, all over Southeast Florida, including in Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood. And if you know where Port Everglades is today, the major shipping port, a substantial amount of that land was owned by Birdie Dewey. Uh, closer to home, she um, bought land in what is today downtown Boynton Beach. She sold it to William Linton uh, with a note and mortgage and William Linton defaulted on it and she had to foreclose and take it back. He had already prepared a plaque for the town in the name of his friend and partner, Major Nathan Boynton. It was to be called the town of Boynton, but they went bankrupt and Bertie Dewey took the land back. But she went ahead and recorded the plat, ladies under the original name, town of Boynton, which I think demonstrates her humility. It was her land, it was her plat, it was her subdivision, but she went ahead and recorded it in the name of Major, of Major Boynton, giving Boynton Beach its name. And for all, you know, more than a century, people like me, uh, the historians of the area, we erroneously thought that Major Boynton had uh, been the man who platted the town of Boynton. In reality, it was not. And a few years ago, two talented ladies, Ginger Peterson and Janet DeVries, local historians, uncovered the real story that it was a lady, Bertie Dewey, who actually owned the original Boynton Beach. And she recorded the plat and she sold the lots and she created the library. She donated the lot so that a church could be started. But because of her humility, she left it in the name of Boynton. So today we have Boynton Beach instead of Dewey Beach or Deweyville. Um, and uh, because she, like Fanny James, had no heirs, her extraordinary contributions to South Florida's history were completely lost until, again, a historian stumbled upon it. Pretty remarkable story. And one final note, if you have been to the Ben Hotel at the site of the old city hall, guess what the Ben Hotel is named after? Bertie Dewey's house, Ben Trabato. And if you look at the executive uh, elevator in the Ben Hotel, it is a silhouette of Bertie Dewey. Pretty incredible story. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Grace Morrison, uh, next slide. Grace Morrison was an early American female aviator who lived in our area because she was the secretary to a famous architect named Maurice Fascio, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, one of the grand and great architects of the Gilded Age in Palm Beach. But in her spare time, like Amelia Earhart, she was a female aviator, one of the few in the country. And she lobbied and lobbied to get an airstrip here, which um, did occur. Next slide, please. Um, uh, unfortunately, she tragically died, um, not in an airplane accident, um, before it could really open. Uh, but it was named in her honor, Morrison Field. And a decade or two later, when we entered World War II, the U.S. Army Air Corps, the predecessor to the United States Air Force, established throughout the duration of World War II an Army Air Corps station at Morrison Field. So it became known throughout America. And I cannot imagine that there were too many other Air Force bases named after women, uh, but there was in West Palm Beach. And when the war ended and we no longer needed uh, uh, an Army Air Corps station, uh, the United States government was going to sell the property and our city administration at the time and our Chamber of Commerce petitioned the U.S. Department of Defense to not just sell it, but give it to us so we could turn it into a proper airport. Next slide, please. Which the Department of Defense did and it became Palm Beach International Airport. So if you wonder how we have an airport uh, at all, let alone where it's located, you can thank Grace Morrison. Next slide, please. 
and getting us up into more modern times. And the last lady I'd like to talk about, though there are many in history, I wanted to spread this out geographically as well as chronologically. I wanna talk about a lady named Ruth Wedgworth, who with her husband, Herman, came to Belle Glade in the 1930s. Herman was a plant scientist hired by um, IFAS, uh, Institute for Food and Agricultural Scientists, to teach farmers in Belle Glade how to farm in that environment. He, on the side, opened his own farm and they had three children, but at a very young age, Herman tragically was crushed to death under a cooler on Wedgworth Farms, which left their family in a terrible position in the height of the Great Depression with young Ruth, who had three young children to raise on her own in a man's world of farming and business. Everyone thought she would sell the land and move away, but she didn't. Uh, one of the strongest willed ladies probably in the history of our county. Ruth operated the farm and raised the three kids on her own and turned Wedgworth Farms into one of the storied uh, farming operations in Florida's history. They're now on their fourth generation of Wedgworth family running it. They were one of the largest celery producers in America. Today, the Wedgworths are one of the largest sugarcane growers in America the largest fertilizer company in Florida, 10,000 acres of cattle, um, you name it, they're involved in it. Her son, of course, was George Wedgworth, who created the Sugarcane Growers Cooperative, which together with Florida Crystals uh, combined to create the largest sugar refining organization on earth. Uh, but it was all due to Ruth. Next slide, please. This is Ruth. When, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is Ruth. She worked until the day she died at 92 years old. Uh, she received many accolades in her life, all well-deserved, but my favorite accolade that she ever received was when the Belle Glade Chamber of Commerce named her Man of the Year. <laughs> because back in those politically incorrect times, uh, it was not called a person of the year award. It was called a man of the year. And uh, Ruth Wedgworth, uh, I imagine, is one of the few women in history to ever be named man of the year. Uh, but she was a great contributor to her um, church, to the economy of Belle Glade. She served on the Palm Beach County School Board. Um, Might have been, I don't know, uh, but I imagine she was the first female to serve on our school board and uh, very quietly paid for many of the farm workers to go to college. I've met several um, people over the years from Belle Glade, almost all of them African-American that said that Ruth quietly paid for them to go away to college and did not want any credit for it. So I will end there because I've talked for a long time, but I hope this is introduced to you um, what I view, in my opinion, as some of the most interesting um, contributors in our local history um, that you may or may not have heard of, but hopefully you know who they are now. Uh, of course, there are many more that I could have highlighted, but I was only given 30 minutes to speak. Uh, so there you go. I would be delighted to try to answer any questions that you have about these ladies, uh, any lady in Palm Beach County's history or anything about Palm Beach County's history. And I'm so delighted that you asked me to come speak to the history of the ladies that laid the groundwork for people like you to be leaders in our community today. None of that would have been possible without ladies like these in our history. So one question was, can you tell us more about the books that you've written? Sure, I am always happy to plug my books. I wanted to uh, teach uh, the next generation of our community's leaders and, um, and uh, voters more about the history of our area. And, uh, and why do I wanna do that? Well, when you know and understand and appreciate your local history, you're a more engaged citizen. Um, you vote in higher numbers, you take pride in your community. And so I wanted to, it's easy for someone like me whose family has been here for 150 years to be interested. What we need is, everyone in our community to be interested. Even if you moved here yesterday, 
from New Jersey, the Caribbean, South America, wherever you moved from, to have the same ownership interest in the community that I feel and no doubt everyone on this Zoom call feels. So how do you do that in the next generation? Do you force feed them names and dates and events like we were force fed history? No, you know, I didn't enjoy that. You probably didn't either in school. So I decided to write an adventure series of books about kids their own age, going on big adventures in the same geography, same place names, um, but let them live the experience. And so I did that through the two characters that I knew, you know, Charlie and Lily Pierce, but it walks the reader through uh, the history of South Florida in a fun, engaging, exciting way. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, Palm Beach County School District, Martin Broward, Miami-Dade, Charlotte Collier Lee, you know, virtually the entire Southern half of the peninsula of Florida has um, made these books required reading in the schools, most of the private and charter schools have as well. So if you have kids that have been through the fourth grade, you're probably familiar with the books. Um, and I am delighted and honored that it's worked out that way. It really exceeded my expectations. But the goal was never to sell books. I sort of sell them at my cost. I don't do it to make money. I do it because I truly want to profoundly change how the next generation of Floridians treat the state and that they do it better than we've done it. Um, you know, not through bad intentions, but just through lack of understanding of the unique ecology, um, water supply, and history of our state. We've made bad policy decisions on the Florida Everglades. You know, we drained two thirds of it, flooded another third of it. Uh, wonder why we have, you know, phosphorus in Florida Bay. We've, you know, put municipal sewage directly into the Atlantic Ocean. We've anchored boats on our reefs. We wonder why our coral reef system is destroyed. We carved the Kissimmee River channel through the largest phosphate deposit in North America and wonder why we have phosphorus in the lake and in the Everglades. All bad decisions made by humans with good intentions. And we need to change that or we're going to ruin the special unique nature of Florida that was the reason we all moved here. So it sounds like sort of a lofty aspirational goal, but that is my goal is to get the next generation of Florida voters to do a much better job than we've done in our generation. And there's a question, there's a specific book you can recommend that highlights Palm Beach County's history. You know, there's not, I get asked that question a lot. I don't know that there's one comprehensive book. The Palm Beach Post over the years printed several books, one called Pioneers in Paradise, which was really the history of West Palm Beach. Um, they did one called Our Century at the turn of the century. That's a pretty good overview. It's not, you know, heavy on text. It's sort of 50% pictures, 50% text, kind of coffee table level book. Um, there are the children's books that I did, but that's written at a fourth grade level, fun to read, but, you know, maybe not at the reading level that you want. Um, this book is the book about Bertie Dewey, uh, the lady that I said two local historians completely uncovered her story. Uh, it's entitled Pioneering Palm Beach. That's an interesting book to read, um, but I don't know that there's any one book that I can refer you to that uh, Ted Brownstein's book about Fanny James. Uh, Jim Snyder has written a number of books about the Jupiter Inlet, the Jupiter Lighthouse. Bessie Wilson Dubois wrote some books about the, the Jupiter area. Uh, so those are, I guess, my best suggestions. And then um, also the follow-up question, who do you think we'll look back on in our modern times as historic Palm Beach County women leaders? Wow, I think there's gonna be a lot to choose from. Um, I mean, one of them is on this call, Jerry Moyo, who I think under her eight years as mayor took West Palm Beach from being you know, just a mid-sized Florida city to on the verge of being one of the great mid-sized cities in America um, and having the vision and the willpower to get big projects and big ideas moving. Um, uh, you know, quite a list, quite frankly, maybe you should invite me back to do a talk about uh, those. It's always dicey talking about people that are still alive uh, because there's personalities mixed in there. You know, Nancy Graham 
probably was, you know, one of the most extraordinary, um, uh, you, you know, forward thinkers of West Palm Beach, envisioned city place and made it happen. Um, uh, but it, it's always hard because all of them had political enemies as well as friends. Lois Frankel was a big mover. I mean, if you think about what, the capital city of, of Palm Beach County had three strong mayors that were females. And I think that's interesting that a city of 110,000 people that is our capital city and our government seat where, you know, the financial capital tends to keep choosing women to be the strong mayor. And I find that interesting. Uh, you had people like Dorothy Wilkin and Bo Cretone as their mayor who became a very strong county commissioner and then a strong clerk of the court. I mean, look at our constitutional officers today. We keep electing, you know, uh, female constitutional officers. So um, I, I think uh, we probably have as many or more female elected leaders in the county today as we do males. Uh, take a look at the West Palm Beach City Commission um, across the board, the city clerk, the city administrator, city commissioners, uh, female. So I think there will be a great history to tell in the future um, that will include more women than men. That's exciting. I noticed that in the election results last night, there were a lot of women that won the races. It was interesting. Um, the final thing is someone asked about if you could tell us about the tours um, that the Historical Society hosts downtown. Yeah, so I'm not totally familiar with them because I'm not still intimately involved, but uh, they, a longstanding Rick Gonzalez architectural tour of the downtown, great tour. Um, he has you step back from the awnings and the sidewalks on Clematis and really look at the architecture. And uh, Clematis is just a sort of a microcosm of a century's worth of architectural school of thought. It's fun to look at and see the difference. Um, you know, there's great Worth Avenue tours that Rick Rose does. He's fabulous. He's a West Palm Beach resident, but does the Palm Beach tours that Jim Ponce used to do. Uh, Jim, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. Um, I'll tell you, the ladies that wrote this book that I just held up, they do a great ghost tour of Woodlawn Cemetery in West Palm Beach during the season. I think it's on Friday nights. It's oversubscribed. And they take you to a dozen different graves of important people in local history. All of them have some salacious who slept with who, who murdered who. You know, it's kind of fun to do on a Friday evening. Uh, there are no real ghosts, but they call it a ghost tour. But it's hugely entertaining. And I strongly recommend that you do that. Very good. So thank you so much. Um, I have someone that said they took one of those history tours and highly recommends them. So thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to ask Katie if you wanted to say a few words about upcoming programs. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm today. This was amazing. Just want to take a quick second. I am a native for here in 1965. And I learned so much today. So thank you very much. You've given us great ideas to for the programs. As the programs chair, that's very important. So thank you. Um, we do have, and Holly, if you can help me, because again, I'm in my car, so I don't have everything in front of me. Um, we have our next Wind Down Wednesday, which is the last Wednesday of the month. And what we are going to be doing, I believe if I'm saying this right, is having it concentrating on Willa. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, there's also something on the calendar that is a, um, it's, we're not hosting it, but it's the, also the end of March. And I believe it's put, being put on by one of the chambers. Is that correct? The women's chamber. The women's chamber, right. We're supporting their event. Sure. Because we partnered with them before on events, so we want to support them as well. Um, Willa is obviously our next big, huge thing. And so everyone, please get engaged in that. Please support as best we can. Um, one thing we are hoping with vaccines and everything coming down the pike these days, we are hoping in the fall to uh, be having um, uh, our event, our season opener in person. We are having May, a recruiting event at the Croquet Center. That's going to be in person. So as things start lessening up, we will start treading the waters lightly, but doing things in person when we can. But the virtual component has really been very amazing this year. And we've done, um, you know, I'm not trying to um, 
take this honor on myself, but Executive Women has done a great job having virtual events just like this. And we've had good attendance and keeping everybody engaged. So even when we do get back to in-person events, we will still host some things virtually because it gives people so many options when we're doing things and with work and life and trying to balance everything. So I just want to thank you all for coming today. Um, and again, Harvey, I can't thank you enough and we'd love to have you back. Um, you always have great ideas and great presentation for us. Does anybody else have anything before we? Uh, I just want to let you know today? that if you've registered for this event, I am going to upload this to YouTube and send a link to those that attended the event or registered for the event. So that will be available. Wonderful. Also, right. we, I wanted to mention the podcast we have of our honorees for Willa are available. Harvey mentioned um, our constitutional officers, one of them, Dorothy Jacks is one of our honorees. So please listen to our podcast. Um, they're really good. And I'll put that in the link with the video. Awesome. All right. Excellent, excellent program. Good seeing you all and thank you all very much. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Take care, bye-bye.